flaw, he'll patch it silently and not tell any of the people who copied that flaw that they need to upgrade. Or when there's a flaw in the documentation of the chip from which people build these libraries, there's never any notice that anyone who built a library for this chip needs to go back and make sure that they did such and such right. Um, so I'm going to start off with a whirlwind tour of Zigbee devices. I'm going to go very fucking quickly through that and also through my second section on local Zigbee exploits because those are things that I've covered in the past. Now, the bulk of this lecture will be about a, a random number generator that should not say timing. It's too late for me to fix slides. Uh, a random number generator uh, attack against the uh, Texas Instruments ChipCon Z stack. This is used for Zigbee smart energy profile implementation, usually in the case of end devices. So this could be used to hack into a thermostat or the home area network side of a smart meter. Um, the gist of it is that if your random number generator is bad and you perform an ECMQV key exchange, your private static key is exposed. So Mallory can have a conversation with Alice. The authentication will fail, but at the end of it, Mallory knows something about Alice's key. She does this five or six times and she's able to recover the key. And this was known cryptographically for quite a while. The cryptographic community had a paper published on it. It was largely ignored because it was theoretical. Um, they said if by some magical means you were able to figure out the first four bits of the ephemeral private key, then you could recover the private static key. And they never described how you might get those four bits or why it was reasonable to expect those four bits. So when I discovered that the random number generator was bad, I did a quick search through a university library and bam, it's broken. Um, also, the vulnerability comes about if you implement the library exactly as the data sheet tells you to do. Um, this is not something that came about because of a software designer um, making a mistake on his own. The software designer trusts the hardware designer's description and documentation of a device without actually knowing how it functions. So on this chip, there's a hardware register that you can just read random bytes from. Those bytes aren't actually random, and there's very little documentation about it. Also, this was fixed silently, and there is still no official announcement that you should upgrade or patch your existing code. There's no errata listing this as a, a problem. In embedded systems, it's common to have an errata sheet that describes all of the analog and digital flaws in a chip, and there's no mention there. Uh, come to Josh Wright's talk tomorrow. He'll be talking about different Zigbee things. And an hour isn't much time, so I'm going to go very quickly. Um, wireless sensors are sometimes called Zigbee as slang because the official word would be IEEE 802.15.4 class uh, low power wireless sensor network device, which is too long. But it's also a specific standard set. And in this, case, in this lecture, I'll be talking about the Zigbee Smart Energy Profile which adds extra cryptography onto the base of Zigbee because um, the default cryptography is not very good. Um, it's longer range than near field RFID, but it's sometimes also called RFID as slang. And the idea is that if you have a very small computer, which is here on the right, and a very small radio, which is there on the left, and an antenna, and a battery, which would plug in over here, or it can run from a solar cell, you can have a computer running Network, uh, running wirelessly on a network for months or years, so long as it doesn't have to transmit very often or very much. The peak bandwidth for this is about 256 kilobytes per second, and you would, in practice you would never sustain that for very long. You only do a burst transmission, and then you turn back off. This is a competing vendor's development kit. Here you have a single chip in the center of the board, which is both an ARM microcontroller and a Zigbee radio. Um, this is a water meter from the city of Paris, or actually a radio repeater for one. So you have a radio chip on each side of the board, 
And as you can see, the whole thing is encased in epoxy. Um, you also have them in smart electric meters. Um, the older in interface was infrared, which you can see here at the bottom. The infrared light shows up in the camera as blue. So the right eye is transmitting, and the left eye is a phototransistor that's receiving. Uh, but there's also a Zigbee radio for communication with devices in the home. This is called the Home Area Network, or HAN. And there's a separate network, which is vendor-specific, that speaks within the neighborhood as a whole. And that is later connected to the electric company. You can use this for metering, for home automation. You can make landmines out of this. And that might at some point be required by international treaty. Because when you have a wireless sensor network in, uh, as your landmines, you can issue them orders. You can tell them to turn off when the war is over. You can cause a ceasefire when friendly troops are moving across. You can um, have them identify friendly troops and uh, refuse to commit friendly fire. Uh, and of course, all of these things can be hacked. So if you have a radio transponder on each soldier that keeps the landmines from blowing up, you can just sort of repeat those packets through a cellular network to make your own proxied transponder and weird stuff like that. It, it's only effective commercial applications at the time being are in children's toys and um, the electric meter industry. It was predicted that this technology would be in everything, that every coffee maker you bought would have it, that every device would work together, and that hasn't yet materialized. Um, I, I am working on a network of seven coffee makers for my apartment, though, such that you can um, order coffee on your way back to the apartment by text message or tweet. Whoa. All right. Um, so in the, in the history of Zigbee cryptography, you had two choices by the standard, and then you could break off from the standard and do your own thing. Um, of course, rolling your own cryptography is a sin, but all crypto implementations were rolled together by someone. So the classic choices were to either store your setup keys internally, but this requires that every device rolling off of the plant be pre-authorized for a particular distribution. So if an electric company only wants to allow its own certified thermostats to be connected, it can restrict that cryptographically by shipping keys within each unit. Um, the other option is to send them over the air, which doesn't work very well when you aren't doing fancy asymmetric mumbo jumbo. Um, so the smart energy profile was created to do a number of things, um, like standardize the packets and application layer for smart electric meters. But among that, uh, they also created new cryptography. In, and through reasons, some of them legitimate, some of them not, the elliptic curve cryptography technology was chosen over which Certicom claims a patent. Um, so if you want to distribute one of these devices, you have to license it from Certicom. I think they're owned by RIM. And they require you to um, sign an NDA and a non-compete, and you have to go through a credit check to make sure that you have enough money to lose if they should decide to sue you for violating the prior two. Um, needless to say, I haven't licensed a copy. Um, the early Zigbee devices were vulnerable to a number of local attacks. Um, I took this photograph at Source Boston last year. This is a Zigbee chip on the left. These three pins are the spy bus over which the microcontroller talks to the radio. If you tap them with hypodermic syringes, you can watch packets go from the microcontroller to the radio and back. The radio, not the microcontroller, implements AES-128. There is a command that says, use this AES-128 key. And it's followed by the key. This is a command byte coming across. There's a similar pattern for the clock line. And you only tap two at once because you're usually getting uh, only the traffic in one direction if you're trying to grab keys. You'll use three syringes if you want um, a full capture. Um, and then there are handy tools for taking this capture, deciphering the bytes from it, and then you have uh, an electronic log 